deadly, deadly. They are killers. That was the only thing available to us. The alternative, of course, was live rounds. I still want to know all these years later why Paul was shot that night. Now, what have we got to combat this array of weaponry? We have one main weapon, just the one, and that's the plastic baton round. An experimental gun tested on the streets of Northern Ireland. A supposedly non-lethal weapon which killed. Tonight on Spotlight, recently declassified documents raised the questions, did the army and police know the weapons were more deadly than they claimed? And did they cover this up? America 2020. The plastic bullet is fired into crowds of Black Lives Matter protesters. This journalist was hit in the eye by a plastic bullet. Despite calls to ban it, this weapon is used in riot control situations around the world. Round after round of rubber bullets. Officers fired six baton rounds to quell the disturbances. And as recently as 2021, used during disorder in Belfast. By then, baton rounds had been used in Northern Ireland for more than 50 years. In 1975, Divis Flats was a huge complex not far from Belfast city centre. This is Divis Flats. There are 1,200 flats here, housing over 4,000 people. Home to William and Teresa Geddes and their four sons. When we moved in, it was the early stages. The, the rest of it was still under construction. And then it became like a concrete jungle. Jim Geddes was the oldest. His younger brother, Stephen, was 10. I remember him being fairly timid. He used to sit up top of the stairs and play the mouth organ, but I'd see him with his little friends out playing. He seemed to be a quiet kid, you know, just an unassuming kid, just did his thing. In August 1975, like other children, Stephen had just returned from six weeks in America on an exchange trip to get away from the troubles. So he stayed in a farm in Watertown, Dakota. And from what I gathered, he took the farming. He loved farming. And when he came back, he had the North Dakota accent. <laughs> and he was afraid to go out because his friends were making fun of him. So my father had said to him, you gotta go out and play with your friends. So he did. Around 7 p.m. on August 28th, Stephen went out to kick a football around. People's doors were all next to each other, but you had this maybe 10 foot wide sort of balcony that you'd walk along, sort of like a mini little street of some respects. By that time, the troubles had taken place. There was lots of army around and they were patrolling these balconies. When the troubles began in 1969, the British Army landed in amongst the civilian population. This was the first time the British Army had commenced an intensive campaign on the streets of the UK. It was something that was completely different. There was bombs going off all over the place, especially in Belfast. Literally. The streets were littered with burnt out cars. And there was that air of a war zone. And that's what it felt like to us, a war zone. Amid the chaos, most people tried to go about their ordinary lives. But others faced off against the military on the streets. 
British troops for having to adapt to dealing with people who, at, at the drop of a hat, could turn from just cold hostility to, for example, immediate rioting. It was rioting all the time. And uh, for little kids, they would see that. And I know that little kids would throw rocks at, throw a few stones at an army patrol going by. It was treated sort of like a pastime. Of course, there were more serious riots, hijackings, riots, shootings, that sort of thing. But the kids, it was just a pastime. The night Stephen went out to play football in Divis, around 8 p.m., a group of children placed a small barricade of empty bottle crates in Albert Street. The events were not caught on camera, but we know what happened from court proceedings. These younger children were either observers or just still playing. They, they'd still continue on playing because they'd seen it before. At 9 p.m., an army patrol stopped in Albert Street. And when soldiers began dismantling the barricade, they were targeted with stones. The army fired two plastic bullets. The second shot is believed to have been bounced off the ground ricocheting and hitting Stephen. When I got home that night, I heard that he was hit on the head and he was uh, rushed, rushed to hospital. Stephen died two days later. So this little guy, uh, you know, never got to grow up and maybe move to the States. I don't know, or, or get married and have children of his own. So never happened. They made it out that there was some major full-scale riot going on which was completely 100% not true. He was out with his friends. He was hanging out where they played soccer. He wasn't gonna be out riding. He just wasn't that type of kid. The rubber bullet gun was invented specifically for use in Northern Ireland for situations where civilians would be present. It was designed to hurt and deter rioters, but not to kill. One of the many new gadgets based on powered soldiering in Northern Irish streets. The riot gun, or the baton gun, which fires the rubber bullet. Designed to keep order with the minimum necessary use of force and minimum political fallout for the generals. While it was seen as an innovation, the reality was very different, as the new gun was invented in a hurry. This speaks to the slightly make do and men nature of trying to come up with a standard British Army anti-riot gun. They're turning World War II flare guns into 1970s riot guns by essentially welding a longer barrel and a stock on them so you can actually aim the thing. It, it's a reasonable place to start to develop something like that, but you wouldn't want to do it overnight, and they kind of had to. The theory behind the rubber bullet gun was a softer bullet shot at a lower velocity would massively reduce the chances of serious harm or death. The intention was these would save lives. These were not designed to, um, to kill innocent people. But from the start, the gun had problems. It was inaccurate and the need to bounce the bullet to reduce its force made the weapon more indiscriminate. The big problem with bouncing something off anything is that you have no control over where it goes. You could be the best shooter in the world and you'll still miss. In April 1972, Francis Rowntree, an innocent 11-year-old boy, was the first person to be killed by a rubber bullet fired into a crowd. Throughout the Troubles, there were allegations the weapons were used in an unsafe manner by soldiers. While many escaped with nasty bruising, others suffered serious head injuries, even brain damage, and people were blinded. Many were bystanders. In my experience, Soldiers were not trigger happy. Soldiers knew what they were supposed to do. But of course, that doesn't mean to say it never happened. In this afternoon's clash, tempers were lost and the tear gas and the rubber bullets began to fly. Soldiers were meant to avoid shooting the bullets at people's heads. 
But this wasn't always happening. You have soldiers uh, who are extremely frightened. You have some soldiers who are bad soldiers. By the mid-70s, the rubber bullet was replaced by a plastic bullet that was supposed to be more accurate. But the deaths and serious injuries continued, as did the calls for the weapon to be banned. The reality is that people died as a result of being hit. You have no chance. If that hits you in the head, hits you in the heart, the impact of that, deadly, deadly. The military publicly held firm to its line that plastic bullets were legitimate, necessary and largely safe. To say that plastic bullets should never have been used, I think is a foolish thing to say. The plastic bullet was a lifesaver, not just a lifesaver for the soldiers whose lives were at risk, but also a lifesaver for people involved in the riots. However, declassified secret documents allow us to see what the MOD and Army hierarchy were saying about plastic and rubber bullets behind closed doors. In 1971, four years before Stephen Geddes was killed, the Army's Land Operations Manual stated baton rounds should not be used against children. Yet these files, secret until now, revealed soldiers were never told. In 1974, the MOD's own scientists condemned the bouncing of bullets, calling it indiscriminate. Yet the practice continued for some time. The MOD and the Army told the public these weapons were non-lethal. But now it seems they were aware of serious dangers posed by the gun, didn't properly train soldiers in its use, and when people were killed, they kept these feelings quiet. The planning, uh, the training, testing was totally and utterly inadequate. And that was very clear from documentation at the National Archives at Kew Gardens. I think it was a cover-up. I think there's clear evidence uh, of a cover-up. In 1976, 13-year-old Brian Stewart was killed by a plastic bullet in Turf Lodge, Belfast. But despite the mounting deaths and injuries, the state decided to expand its use of plastic bullets by providing the RUC with its own riot gun. The trouble came as the street campaign in support of Bobby Sands is being stepped up right across the province. Yeah. The new police gun arrived just before one of the worst years of street disturbances in the Troubles, 1981. It was the year that IRA inmates in the Mays prison went on hunger strike. Around 9 p.m. on April 15, 1981, Helen Withers and her husband Des were at home in Londonderry. There was a knock at the door and there was a young lad at the door and he said, um, he said, your son has been shot with a plastic bullet. And I could feel a certain, like a coldness running through me. Helen's son, Paul, was just 15. He was taken to hospital and put on life support. After about 10 days, um, it was all explained to us by the doctors that there was no life, and it was the machine that was keeping the body alive. So um, We were presented with the scenario, and the decision was to turn off the machine. Those 10 days, you kind of think, well, even though you knew and say that it was, um, Paul was the first person in Northern Ireland to be killed by a baton round, fired by police. He was a gregarious teenager. Well, Paul, was a character. Um, he was full of fun. He was this intelligent, bright boy, full of fun, full of curiosity. Um, he was very affable. He loved fishing. He loved the music, and his favourite was group was the Boomtown Rats. In London Derry, 
A 15-year-old boy was buried who died after being hit by a police plastic bullet 10 days ago during the rioting in the city. When Paul was shot, he had been in a group of around a dozen teenagers who'd been throwing stones on a day of hunger strike related trouble. And this did not sit with me because that's not who Paul was. We weren't political, let's put it like that. And then I had to face the fact that they had a mask on. And I still find that hard. Paul and others have been throwing stones at a bakery from which police emerged. The inspector ordered one of the constables to discharge a round, um, a plastic bullet round. Paul was struck on the forehead and collapsed and officers came out, lifted his body and dragged him back into the bakery. The police said they acted to protect lives and property. But the Witters family has always strongly disputed the level of threat from a group of boys throwing stones. They always believed the police did not need to shoot. He absolutely could, absolutely could have been arrested. These constables were in full riot gear, burly men. A 15-year-old boy standing looking at them. Why did they do it? I wish somebody would explain to me how, how they could take a gun and just aim it and shoot. Four years after Paul's death, a weapons expert examined the plastic bullet gun used in his killing and found it was shooting inaccurately. But now, declassified documents accessed by the campaign group, the Pat Finucane Centre, reveal another serious issue with the make of weapon being used by the police across Northern Ireland at that time. They reveal that government scientists had warned that the RUC riot gun had been used on the streets of Northern Ireland without being evaluated in accordance with medical committee practice. In other words, its potential risks to civilians had never been properly tested. Meanwhile, these weapons are being used improperly. Children and adults are losing their lives. People are being blinded. People are having serious head and chest injuries. Having been told of the RUC gun's lack of testing, one government official suggested in writing it would be a bad idea to go back and fully test the weapon in case it then failed the evaluation. This, they said, could raise politically sensitive and embarrassing questions. And this was kept hidden for decades. We asked the police about the failure to fully test the RUC riot gun before firing it at people. In a statement, Assistant Chief Constable Alan Todd told us Policing has changed considerably in the past 42 years, as have operational procedures. The issue, deployment and use of these weapons is now strictly regulated and approved, and also automatically referred to the police ombudsman. On the streets, the guns continue to be used. In May 1981, 14-year-old Julie Livingston was hit by a bullet fired by the army in Belfast. She had been on an errand to a local shop. In July, 33-year-old mother of three, Nora McCabe, was out buying milk at 7.45 in the morning when she was shot by police. The RUC claim that a riot was taking place was later proven to be untrue. So this the suggestion that, um, you know, all these killings were excusable. How do you explain the deaths of children from 10, 11 years of age? Inexcusable. In all, seven people were killed by plastic bullets in 1981. That same year, serious rioting took place in cities across England. No plastic bullets were fired. Not one of those bullets was ever, ever fired in Britain but it was acceptable to use lethal weapons such as those in Northern Ireland. The government came under international pressure to curtail the weapons use after 1981. But in the years that followed, 
four more people were killed by plastic bullets. In all, at least 16 people died. A 17th was killed by a fall, possibly after being hit by a plastic bullet. But the circumstances are disputed. In some cases, the victims were rioting. But in many others, they were bystanders. Eight were children. <laughs> For years, the families of the victims were silent. But after the Good Friday Agreement, many began to ask questions about the findings of inquests and investigations into these killings. After Stephen Geddes' death, the Royal Military Police and RUC investigated, but only gathered statements from soldiers. The original Geddes inquest uh, was perfunctory in nature. The RUC investigation uh, was also uh, a failure. There were no civilian witness statements produced at the inquest, and this relates to the death of a 10-year-old child on the streets of Belfast. I found that quite shocking. The Geddes family felt the original inquest pointed blame at them. My mother, if I recall, without maybe exaggerating, she cried every day for over two years, every single day. She just couldn't get past it. Any parent that has a child killed by any violent means, it's an awful thing. It's an awful thing for a parent, their families. But I do have to ask the question, in the middle of a riot, uh, why is a child out in those areas? I wouldn't have let my child anywhere near it. The army go there and they fire this lethal weapon. How can a child be in the wrong place at the wrong time when they're in the only place they had to play? Last year, 47 years after Stephen's death, a new inquest concluded there was no justification for the army shooting him. It's acknowledged that he was an innocent child in his own neighborhood, in his own play area. The coroner said the MOD and British Army had not always provided adequate training or passed on information on the use of rubber and plastic bullets to soldiers. And this was a factor in Stephen's death. I felt, I felt it was justice. And there was a, a sort of a sorrow, yeah, looking back and thinking, why, why did it take so long? We asked the Ministry of Defence for its response to the inquest findings and to secret documents that reveal the army knew it should not be shooting at children or bouncing bullets, but continued to do so. An MOD spokesperson said it would be inappropriate to comment because of an ongoing legal challenge being taken by the soldier who fired the shot. The Witters family began to campaign for a fresh inquest over 40 years ago. Eventually, in 2007, the police ombudsman found the RUC hadn't conducted a proper investigation into Paul Witters' death and concluded there was no justification for officers to shoot him because he had been no threat to life or property. The police ombudsman found the officer could have, they could have tried to apprehend Paul. Throwing stones shouldn't be a death sentence, shouldn't lead to the loss of life. PSNI Assistant Chief Constable Alan Todd told us he fully appreciated the pain and suffering still being experienced by the Witters family. He accepted the Ombudsman found Paul shooting unjustified, but noted there had been no evidence his killing was deliberate. In 2018, there was a fresh development. We discovered that there was a file on named Paul Witters um, that was in the National Archives that was closed until 2059. We couldn't understand what could be in the file. The Witters family wanted to know why a file on the death of a teenage boy was being kept secret. They spent the next four years pleading with the Northern Ireland office 
to give them full access to its contents. Eventually, in June 2022, the NIO granted the family access. And tucked away amongst almost 200 pages, the widders learned startling new information. When an RUC plastic bullet was fired, a metal end cap was supposed to drop off as the bullet left the barrel. Documents in the secret file record that the NIO and RUC were aware that this didn't always happen, meaning plastic bullets with metal tips were hitting people. There was a real danger that they were then being lodged, using their words, lodged in people's skulls. Also buried in the declassified file was a report from a forensic scientist, which said it was likely Paul was one of those hit by a metal end cap. A forensic report then also suggested that the end cap may also have struck Paul, and then obviously raises questions of, well, was that a significant cause of his death? Yet in spite of the forensic report, the 1982 inquest verdict never mentioned the police knew they'd been firing faulty plastic bullets that could have been a factor in Paul's death. We only now know all of this because the file was eventually opened. We asked the PSNI about the Witters family's view that this NCAP issue had been covered up. It did not specifically address this question. This version of the bullet was later replaced. The Witters family and their lawyer believe the new information in the file could be grounds for a new inquest. But in May last year, the government signalled an end to any new Troubles inquests when it announced legacy proposals which, if they pass into law as expected, will mean such inquests will end for good. And it was only after the door was shut on fresh inquests that the Northern Ireland office released the full Paul Witters file to the family. It was too late for any new information to be of use. You have to be cynical about the timing. Um, they made a great song and dance about releasing this file to us um, just after the possibility of doing anything with it had passed. You have to be cynical. In a statement, the NIO told us it was simply not the case that it waited to release the full file until the opportunity for a fresh inquest had gone. It said it initially withheld parts of the file to protect the safety of individuals named in the documents, but it listened to the widder's concerns about the level of material withheld and, as a result, made the whole file available. These issues aren't just matters of historic significance. They also have modern day implications. plastic bullets have continued to be fired in this one part of the UK. Campaigners want the guns banned now, and an inquiry into their historic use in Northern Ireland. But some former soldiers defend the weapon. It's the best that we had at that time. And imperfect though it may have been, it did work. It kept lots of people alive, it kept uh, me alive, it kept my colleagues alive, it kept civilians alive. So imperfect though it was, it was effective. So I have no, no problems about using it, even with hindsight. In the meantime, despite the government's legacy proposals, the families of rubber and plastic bullet victims continue to hope for the truth. They argue this isn't just about the past, it's a reality they live with every day. I still want to know all these years later why Paul was shot that night. And I've never got an answer. Families like us who have suffered for however many years it is, we do need some kind of an answer.